Hey, welcome. My name is Robert Clark. I'm the president of the historic Annapolis. And we are proud to sponsor tonight's guest speaker, Mr. Joe Riley, in cooperation with Mayor Buckley in the city of Annapolis. During his 10 years as Mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, Mayor Riley transformed Charleston and addressed some of the same issues facing downtown Annapolis. Charleston's journey holds lessons for all of us as we look to preserve and enhance the purposes authentic historic downtown while creating an enticing public open space other city have. I had the pleasure to spend some time with Mayor Wiley today. And I believe there's a great deal we can learn from him. This is the first of a few lectures we hope to bring to town where we bring in experts from around the country to learn from our best practices. The second lecture, which will be late June or early July, will feature Dr. Tim Chapin, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy from the Florida State University. Dr. Chapin will speak about integrating autonomous vehicles into the historic built environment. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart and promises to be very interesting. We're currently finalizing the details of it. I'll share those with you soon. Our goal through the City Doc Action Committee process is to continue and improve the high quality of life in Annapolis that we all enjoy. People love Annapolis because of the rich experiences it has to offer the world and the city doc experience even better. Through this lecture series, we hope to provide inspiration by way of thought provoking conversation that will inform our path to a reimagined city doc. I thank you for being here this evening, and I thank our partners, Mayor Gavin Buckley and the City of Annapolis, the Downtown Annapolis Partnership. Visit Annapolis, Katz and Brothers, Severn Bank, and Marilyn Hall for Creative Arts, as President and CEO Marvin Davis and her entire staff for all their assistance making tonight possible. And I'd like to introduce you to our mayor, Kevin Walker. Thank you all so much for coming out. A little bit of rain out there, but uh, it means so much that we all get behind these events, so thank you. Um, I'm so excited to introduce to you um, one of my heroes, um, Joe Riley. I um, uh, read a lot about Joe Riley. I haven't actually been to Charleston. Um, I do know two um, things that he did that really were seminal moments for him. Uh, the first was and the way I read it was, he woke up one morning and didn't really uh, think that the Confederate flags flying in the state capital was a good thing, a good message. And he decided to walk from uh, Charleston to um, Columbia, the state capital of South Carolina. But he didn't realize how far it was, that's the way he wrote the story. <laughs> so, so it took them a little bit of time, but uh, I think they got the message. Um, another thing that's an interesting story they had, he proposed, um, a park at city that is a uh, waterfront and a hotel and uh, there was a poster that we had and it's a picture of um, uh, a, a cruise ship, a, uh, a Ferris wheel, <laughs> uh, and a casino and uh, a big sign that said, Joe Riley has been ruined Charleston. Well, he obviously did not. Charleston is uh, an amazingly beautiful place um, that we could learn stuff from. So. Um, I've been an admirer of his um, for a long time. He's a kind of forward-thinking, action-oriented man that every city deserves. He has said in speeches before, and he might say it tonight, that a great city is just a city. You can't work towards a city that serves people without thinking about how well it serves its people. He began his 10 terms as mayor by rethinking the way Charleston dealt with public housing. There are lessons Annapolis can learn from Mayor Riley. He rethought about the way people of colour should be included in all parts of Charleston, not just city jobs, but jobs in the mayor's office and as department heads. There are lessons Annapolis can learn from Joe Riley. He rethought the functionality of his city in terms of pedestrians and cars and bicycles. He spent much of his 40 years rebuilding downtown and attracting the kind of businesses that made it a premier destination. There are lessons we can learn from Joe Riley. 
He helped the city coexist with a military academy, the Citadel. We've got our own naval academy downtown. Surely there are some lessons we can learn from Joe Riley. Go Navy. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> he helped develop a resiliency plan in the aftermath of Hurricane Hugo, which has hit, which had hit his city hard in 1989, causing more than nine billion in damages. Annapolis is a compact city of just seven square miles with some 17 miles of shoreline. We are just as vulnerable to a big storm as Charleston. There are lessons we can learn from Joe Riley. Just a few years ago, before our own mass shooting at the Capitol Gazette, Charleston had to deal with a mass shooting when a gunman opened fire on parishioners at Emmanuel AME Church. The entire community was rocked by this violence. There are lessons we can learn from Joe Riley. If you've ever heard one of his talks, they're very inspiring. To start off with, describing a problem, envisioning a solution, and then he comes up with the words, and then we did a deal. This public-private partnerships are the model for cities, large and small. Taking advantage of that, a city has to offer a private business and leveraging them to enhance the city is a great way to live with today's budget austerity. It inspires me. I hope it will inspire you. The lessons we can learn from Mayor Riley tonight, I hope will help us better understand how a city can make changes but still hang on to its rich history. I hope this talk will showcase how unscary some forward-thinking ideas were for Charleston and perhaps can be for an atlas. Speaking of scary, we are probably not going to do the bocce court this summer. <laughs> what? <laughs> because I understand that the ULI committee is working vigorously on some ideas for City Dog, and I do not want to dilute those ideas. So the pop-up idea we had planned, we'll probably put it on hold till next summer. We still work on the ice cream, so we'll still get ideas out there that will be exciting to just imagine what a public space could be like at City Dock instead of a tarmac parking lot. But I understand that I don't want to um, derail any of the hard work that's been done by that committee, and so we're going to hold off for a little while on that. And I'd like to thank Severin Savings Bank for sponsoring this event. None of this stuff can be done without sponsors and without support from the business community. I'd like to thank the Market House for the delicious cheese board and wine they provided. They also gave Joe Riley some crab cakes at the Market House today, which were amazing. I'd like to thank the Downtown Annapolis Partnership. And of course, Visit Annapolis. Uh, Connie has been a big supporter and a big, as soon as I suggested Joe Riley came into town, she said, we are in. And of course, Katzer Brothers. Neil Katzer, we can always count on him when it comes to these things. From this to the Clydesdale, his company has always been there for him. And he has lost a dear, dear friend recently. Um, he was the treasurer for Speaker Bush, and uh, we all mourning that loss. And I'd especially like to thank Robert Clark and Historic Annapolis Foundation for their sponsorship, their partnership, and their leadership. And without any further words, let's start reimagining City Dock with Speaker, Mayor, the Mayor's Mayor, Joe Riley. Thank you so very much, Mayor uh, Buckley, for your kind words, and um, and thank you for your energy and leadership for this great historic American city. I uh, I got to work as mayor, as you heard, for a long time, and I and I've loved working with the mayor, and I love watching mayors, and, and mayors like your man with the, the energy and the vision and the spunk and the guts to to work with the citizens to do community forward is always so inspiring for me. So to come to back to Annapolis, this is a great American city, great historic city, great waterfront city, and a great spirited city, and coming back to see uh, this man with such energy and commitment is thrilling indeed. And I look forward to good Lord willing to watch uh, 
we continue unfolding the next chapters of this American treasure. I want to thank uh, all that you have allowed me to come today and, uh, and uh, Robert Clark and, uh, uh, and the foundation that he leads, um, the staff of the city, uh, the staff of the historic Annapolis, and, uh, and, and all of you for coming today. Uh, the, the, the success of the city in part depends upon its willingness to continue to reimagine, to reimagine that future, reimagine a more livable city. I will talk today about, about the city and my experience in Charleston, the, the city in large, in large, uh, in, in many facets of it. But, uh, but you know, uh, Jim Rouse, and I was talking with one of his uh, former colleagues here earlier this evening, and I got to work with Jim. He was head of the National House and Task Force many years ago. We met regularly and came up wonderful new initiatives for our country. He's such a wonderful man. I remember he said that water is magic. And the need of it, and you know, most cities are on water. Most older cities are on water for obvious reasons. And the degree to which a city celebrates its water's edge and attends to it with a commitment to the beauty and excellence is the extent to which the city, I believe, can continue to prosper further. Look at great cities around the world and what happens on the water's edge for the citizens and for all the visitors, done with quality and with great vision as inspiring and I'm confident. And I come to the tonight with no uh, specific, with no recommendations for you, just to salute the process that you're in and my complete faith that it will yield extraordinary results for your great city. So I will uh, talk about uh, the city tonight and I imagine the work this equipment and if I'm not working it they will tell me and uh, it's a new piece of equipment uh, very good and, and I am I'm an old piece of equipment <laughs> so when you have an old piece of equipment working with a new piece of equipment interesting things happen Charleston is a old American city it was built before the automobile in the elevator. The city of remarkable human scale and physical beauty, and a, and a city that the Industrial Revolution passed by. So it was not knocked down by the wrecking ball because of a huge amount of economic progress. In fact, uh, the economy was pretty dim after the Civil War in Charleston. But Charleston, as you have that wonderful preservation leadership, Star Charleston Foundation, Foundation Preservation Society, and the mothers and fathers got the city council a long time ago to adopt the nation's first preservation ordinance. So the city of Charleston, beauty and scale is preserved. But, but cities are not preordained, nothing is automatic, and cities are filled with all kinds of opportunities for huge achievement and, and great mistakes and failure. Now this was a great mistake. This was the demolition of the Star Charleston Hotel. Now that was where the Democratic Convention of 1860 met. Historic and beautiful. But it was demolished in the 50s because city leaders knew for sure to be a great city. You had to have a drive-in hotel. It wasn't a great city without a drive-in so in this business of city building and, and reimagining of the making of planning is we must work hard to not make any mistakes like this mistake. So we started in the core section of our city uh, with a challenge of affordable housing and we had vacant lots. And we wanted to put affordable housing in the vacant lots. And uh, the neighborhoods had three buildings like this, they addressed the sidewalk, 
and um, you know, in a wonderful scale. And, um, and then, uh, that's what the houses look like in the city. And uh, they built affordable housing in the 60s. Well, meaning, we need some better affordable housing. But it looked like that. It was ugly as sin. And they put a cyclone fence around it to warn you this was not a safe neighborhood and no one should want to live there. Forget it. So, anyway, we were determined to build beautiful, affordable housing. We picked the young architect and he designed that. It didn't cost any more than the other stuff. Won national awards. So, we had that experience when the housing authority got a grant to do the housing project. And they were so excited to say, We were just going to build a new project. I said, we're not going to build any more process in there. You can go to the impeachment as long as any of us. I said, no, I know, I know all that. Now you can grab your chair and you can give it back. So anyway, the uh, housing authority said, we're not going to build any more housing projects. And I said, we're not building a housing project. So we said, you'll get impeached and all that kind of stuff. But this ignored all the accumulated lessons of Western civilization. How do you build towns in cities? It's beauty and scale. So I so said, we're not going to build this. We want to scatter the public housing on the vacant lots in the city. Well, they didn't think that was a very good idea, but a lot of my citizens didn't either because they got nervous about the housing next door. They said, the average American had to make up and want to say, honey, wouldn't it be good if we could get some of that public, that public housing next door? So we had to uh, <laughs> sell the citizens all the, all the sites, and then we picked the site, and then we picked the architects, ugly as sin, found this architects, and we got other architects, and then this is what was built. It won awards from the President of the United States because we showed America that you could build with beauty uh, public housing. When I was at a cocktail party with the President in one of our college's homes after we were opening these, a server came up to me with a tray of food, you know, crushing people and just kind of weaving to give me something. And she said, Mariah, I want to thank you. And I said, What's that for me? And she said, Because Monday, I'm moving into Saturday Marriott Street. That was one of the things. It was so beautiful. And I thought back then, maybe a mayor would not have a perspective tenant of public housing used the word beautiful before. But the fact of the matter is, there is no instance, no justification under any circumstance ever of anything in the city that doesn't add to the beauty of the city. Now, that one public housing building right there that came with catalyst for revitalization of the neighborhood. Then we worked on the really run down of the neighborhoods and because you rebuilding a city, you've got to do it holistically for everybody. Everybody, including the poor citizens. So get these buildings from getting knocked down. And your great achievement, national achievement of star preservation is uh, speaks for itself, but you know every time we save an old building, we keep piece of texture, fabric, history, scale, memories of the community. That's one danger in America is that if we don't look out and look what happened in Annapolis, but it will be a seven-year-old country. You know, everything's about seven years old. You know, and when it's seven years old, you tear that up. There'll be no, no, no consistency and no scale. So anyway, we say several hundred of these. We, uh, these were all restored as affordable housing. And, um, we did several hundred of these, all affordable housing in one form or another. We created nonprofits and, uh, you know, did some of our own subsidized uh, uh, developers. And um, this here was um, burned out, as you see on the left. And we created a, a new housing nonprofit to do this one. And um, I took these pictures myself. Um, because I love the thought of a really, a, a person of very modest resources having a third floor piazza overlooking the 19th century roofscape, uh, skyline, and steeples of our city. These were called Freedmen's Cottages. They were uh, built by African Americans after the Civil War with illegally owned land, one story of what we call Charleston Single House. The neighborhood was horrible. Hurricane Hugo 89 about dead men. But we knew we had to save them. So we worked with Habitat, the first rehab job they did in America, built all new. And churches and Habitat restored the neighborhood, restored these, it's changed the neighborhood. 
And then we were looking for the design, what do you design for transitional housing? That's when people can move out of the shelter of the homeless, got a great shelter for the homeless. And so this was designed by a wonderful young architect and um, it won an award from the AIA. Uh, that's a really poor guy, just out of the shelter, has a little bit of a, a space there, uh, but, but good design. You know, so often when we, we build things in cities, somebody say, well, you know, it's just. And, and you can never say it's just. If, uh, if, if people can see it, then it has to be beautiful, whatever it is. And these uh, add a greatly beauty. But we knew it was a corner of life. And you can keep going. There's a quarter lot, and if you lose a quarter lot, if you lose a quarter lot, the virus spreads. Then the next one we get sick, you know, and that's what happened. So then that's what it, then it took us, we worked on this neighborhood for a lot. So then the next iteration, we got a nonprofit to come work with us, and how they thought it. So that's now owned by the housing thought in this little piece of the neighborhood that's just going gangbusters now. And then the next, next picture you see is the back of that, which you saw fall down by the road. That's owned by the housing thought. Then we have um, regular uh, Washington <coughs> houses built within there. And this is really a cool old picture of the neighborhood you can show this here. And that's all kinds of different affordability levels including a uh, private home ownership in this one little neighborhood that all made possible because we didn't like that building fall down. And this is our fabulous first time home buying issue in this neighborhood. First time home buyers hadn't been in a house before. But, but all of those components fit in front of one neighborhood, all because we didn't let that house come down and it was going to save that, that car. So then we will uh, go on to this picture. And uh, this is uh, our downtown. King Street. It was the main street. When I was a child, it was the shopping center of coastal South Carolina. It was prime. And then, of course, a downtown got sick. And our downtown got very sick. And you know, at first, you don't know what the illness is. So, Lots of uh, treatments were tried that just made the illness worse. So we did a great strategic plan, which you're doing here so important, a great strategic plan to figure out how we would restore a case. And we started studying what the building used to look like and then to get owners to put some money into it to fix uh, old houses and we'll have them fall down and put apartments on the second the third floor of the houses, and that started to give it life to K Street. And then they wanted to tear this down and put it out. Really nice guy. He contributed generously to that campaign and didn't know why we wouldn't have him tear the building down. So we got some money in there and restored it. We got apartments on the second and third floor, got a shop on the first floor. And each one, each piece you do starts to bring life back to it. Now, this was the Schwartz building. And old Mr. Louis Schwartz on that, and it didn't look all that hot, and then we put some money into it and restored it, and it looked fabulous. And uh, then the Hugo got it. Oh my God. <coughs> Morning after Hugo, there's a Schwartz building in the street. We got another person to come in and put another piece in there. So King Street was starting to come in. We had this big problem, a big vacant lot right in the middle of the kitchen. Now, uh, you don't need to get to know Charleston as well, but I'll tell you, explain this uh, lot. Now, that was, when I was a child, two department stores were there. It was gangbusters. And then they died, and they got torn down. So the main street is the street dog legs from top to bottom on your left. That's where belts and panties and others were. And then that's what we had. So we had a, a strategic development plan. It said the obvious, what you need to do is you got to put a lot of critical mass there to pedestrianly connect the street in the middle on the right. So look to the right in the middle, and you see some red roofs. So that was Market Street. They need to connect Market Street with the energy of the people 
The last ruling we would be to change her the street that dog land and then start sending that energy up and down the street. So uh, Market Street it started coming back a little bit. So we had some help there. Well, Market Street much had not a very good reputation. It was written that, uh, that Market Street was the only place in America that for two minutes uh, you can get a bowl of chili, a tattoo, or a communicable disease. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, the Market Street was a little bit of energy if we just connected with Kingston. So we um, had to respect the scale of the buildings. Couldn't put really tall stuff there on the street, but we needed energy. <clears throat> Couldn't be, you know, thinking and uh, had to protect the market hall, you know, like a family hall, to move the street back a little bit, insisting on pedestrian uh, retail activity on the first floor. That's what we got. Huge effort. And actually, uh, you all know, many of you know Bob Emery and David R. David Cordish from Baltimore that helped us with this. And so we got the, the uh, critical mass there and the retail and everything. And then the, it's a bigger building, but you see it set back. And uh, so we protected the street and got the energy. Now I'll show you two details. The details are very important. You know, and details are very important in what we do in life. You know, everything we do detail. We're saying this in the details are very important. Yeah, that's not the wrong question. So, there, so two, two details. One was a parking garage up on the upper right. I'll show you that in a minute. And then the other detail is the developer wanted the pre assembly space, it's Hotel Conference Center, where you have a drink or coffee before the meeting, right? So you come down the elevator. You see where the elevator block is obviously right in the middle of the When you come down the elevator to the second floor, you peel up in the pre assembly space. That's perfect, right? So they said, that's where you put the pre assembly space. I said, well, where will the kitchen go? And they said, well, that would be on the King Street side. Whoops, go back again. Um, thank you. That would be on the King Street side. And, and I said, well, you have no windows. I said, you know, look here, in a city, it used to be if you owned a block of building on the city, you were honored to do that and you respected it. So building, building with phony windows, no windows, kitchens, and all that kind of stuff, we're not going to do that. We would put that in the middle and we put the pre-assembly space on the street. So they did exactly that. And then you see it's fabulous pre-assembly space. Look at the next one. You can look at it. And no kidding, see the city. Because you know, sometimes you get these places, you don't know where the city is, where, where you are, and you see the city, and then from the street you look out, and you see the civic engagement of activity going on that connects, you know, you know it's a civic activity that belongs to you as, as a citizen, even if you're not there. And so you can see that, and then, uh, so then, um, Charleston Place was a huge success, and, uh, and Dozens of buildings keep going, and I know Mountain Bell crazy, everybody out there. Uh, and so, but, but dozens of buildings got restored uh, because the right catalytic agent, the right plan uh, went together for King Street. So, uh, one Sunday, I was walking up King Street after church about New York Times, and, um, and I saw these girls walking right about there. And uh, my brother's girl to walk in. And, uh, and I saw this fellow walking about there. This is noon on Sunday. And, um, and I knew him. He was retired and married and lived in the suburbs. But noon on Sunday, he was walking by himself, a kitchen. I approached him and I was, you know, I said, How, how are you doing? He said, Fine. I said, well, What are you doing here now? And he kind of got flushed, you know, like, he was going to have to feel an emotion, which we may have never want to do. I think it's that third that too. And he said, well, uh, Doris and I met in the early church, and uh, he said, Joe, um, she just had some stuff to around us, and I just like to come down here and walk around because it looks so nice, and I'm so proud. So that's why we do all that we do, to, to create that sense of pride in every city, every city. 
But then we keep going. You know, we know Mr. Mayor will get the calls at 2 in the morning. It's just big fire. On up the case, people were really struggling. And, uh, and I got went there with the red firefighters, you know, the red firefighters. I thought, lots of them. But amazingly, they contained it just in one building. So the next morning, I went there, you know, and, and that's what I had, the Blue Steam building. So the building official called me at 8.15. He said, Mayor, we're letting the uh, permit for the demolition of Blue Steam building. I said, no, you're not. He said, Mayor, it's going to fall on the street and kill people. And I said, well, we barricade the sidewalk. You know, it's not going to kill people and barricade the sidewalk. But that was a corner building. Now, if that building come down, this part of King Street was really struggling bad. You lose the Blue Steam building and the virus spreads, you know. So we worked with the Blue Steam family. We, we acquired, the next picture we'll show, we acquired the facade. Preserve the facade. Fix the building up. They, you know, with, with, they, they obviously invested in it. And you had a nice restored Blue Steam building, as you see right here, rather than a day and lot. And that and that became a catalyst uh, for the restoration of that part of our city. This is obviously a parking garage, I'll get to that just a minute. But, but you know, if we had let Blue Steam come down, and there's some friends up from Charleston here that know what's going on in our location right now, but if we had lost that piece of fabric, they catch the story. Blue Steam found it, came in from Eastern Europe, you know. Pedals and come merchants built a building with a name on it and let it come down. The heck with that. So, anyway, it's a, been a great thing. So, now we will go on to parking garage. And uh, so, we need to build new parking garage and we need to build parking garage to allow for the waterfront park, which I'll show you in just a minute. So, this is a, a part of the street in Charleston. And so, I we hired an architect and I said, now this is all show you. Bill. But I said, we need a parking garage that would look like a parking garage. And they were so polite. And they were flooded with half, you know. They said, Mayor, you, you do not understand that an architect to form follows function and the building is supposed to look like what it is. So it's supposed to look like a parking garage. Yeah. And I said, well, that's really a great principle, but we're not going to do that at this particular location at all. <laughs> and I said, I want a building with like closed shutters. They didn't want to do this. I said, please for talking around town, show the building called the closed shutters. And uh, but he, it was like he would give me a louver, but if his manhood was questioned if you could not see the car looking at the parking lot, you know. So anyway, I persisted, and I persisted. We wanted more nationality. The, the, the chairman of the National Endowment of Arts came to Charleston in a ceremony to give us an award for a parking garage. They don't, the doubt doesn't get awards for specific design things. And, uh, but it was like, we helped show the country, you know, you didn't have to build these things that massive and, and, and industrial and all like that. So that made we got law firms in the first floor, we had subway for a while, and all kinds of uses, and then it saved our part. Now, this is back in, in Charleston Place, the big about and the other details, was we need to put a big parking garage there. But we wanted to save these buildings. And uh, they were right, we need to put a parking garage. So we worked out where we could save the building up to 50 feet, take the backs off, they were all warehouse buildings with a little, you know, mercantile front, and then put the parking garage back there, and then fixed up to 50 feet. And, and we told the owners that they wanted to Keep the front 50 feet, they could do that, we would pay them for the back, or we buy the whole thing. Well, so some kept the front 50 feet, and some sold us the whole thing. So for a while, we owned some buildings and had valid leases. And one of the buildings up there, you can't quite tell, it was two thirds of the way up, had a valid lease for a strictly joint. Yeah. Uh, so for a while, the city owned a building that was a strictly joint. <laughs> And the male members of our legal department insisted that it was their duty to inspect the premises every night to make sure. I know they they're good. Anyway, now, see, then it gets fixed up. 
This was a little while back that you can tell about how short I got the pants off. But, uh, but, uh, but I like it. Right now, at Heinemann's uh, restaurant, there are 55 people out on that top. Well, this way, is so, but I like this picture because those people are in charge. Because the buildings are at their scale. And that's what is so important in the American city that we can. The building can be a big thing and build all things, but you bring the scale down. What happens at the pedestrian level is, is a human scale. You know, we don't, we don't see cities, so this type of library is an app, because you've got the right scale. But, but we don't see cities, you know, if the, we don't see cities at the top of the buildings. We see the cities in that first 10 to 20 feet as you're negotiating the city. That's how you see it. And if it's, if it's your scale, that's great. Then the parking garage goes behind, it's very beautiful, but we protect the front. And then this next slide shows you a bridge coming into town. And um, this was a bridge coming in Charleston with no bridge existed before. So it's connecting a suburban community, a suburban community, with the peninsula for the first time. It was coming down on an old kind of main street on Speed Up Street. So a preservation organization said, Joe, do you have a plan for Calhoun Street with the new bridge coming in? We got a query coming in the other end. And I said, no, don't talk about it. Tell us a thing. So we quickly got the preservation organization, they put together the civic institutions and everything, and they came up with the plan, just which I like to do. And it helped us figure out what Calhoun Street could be. It could be Great Urban Boulevard, and it had the uses that we wanted and the uses that we didn't want. So luckily, we got the plan for Calhoun Street when there's always your good friends. Good friends of mine bought this building on Calhoun Street. That's what it looked like. And they were going to build a max sleep in a cheap motel. Well, luckily, our plan said we didn't want any motels on that street. So I told my friends that they couldn't build their max sleep in on the street, which they didn't really like that at all. And uh, so they took it to the city council, and I won by one vote. You have to cheap motel. He's a good friend. When you make up, you know, you, 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 you gotta keep keep moving forward. So then, rather than cheap motel, the county was gonna move the library to downtown, and so we got a new library instead of cheap motel because the citizens said we have a we have the right to have a plan. Then across the street was the service parking lot, and we worked with the school board. They were gonna move out of downtown. We got a school board building, city building, um, vacant lot. Go back. A vacant lot across the street, back one time, across the street, uh, so you go back, it's hard to go back, but across the street, so you got, because of the plan, we had a library, a quintessential public building, a library across the street from another public building, keep moving forward because there was a plan. So then, the next slide will show us the Francis Marion Hotel. So this is part of the Calhoun Street plan. We needed it to be a hotel, but it kept going broke. And then somebody got it, put some chewing gum in the cracks or whatever, and then they fixed it up, and then another one would buy it. And um, so finally, no one would buy it, and the Prudential owned it in foreclosure. And so I called the Prudential guy and said, man, we've got to keep this as a hotel. Well, the College of Charleston wanted to buy it for a dorm. But if it's a dorm, what happens? <laughs> you know, everybody knows that used to be a hotel, so if the dorm, it means that things just aren't going that good on the street anymore, and the best thing they do is the dorm. Nothing bad about the dorm, but that's a hotel. So I told them the college they could not buy for a dorm. Now, I did not have the legal authority to tell the college they could not buy for a dorm, but I told them why. So we, we worked with the developer and we put all kind of money into it. I don't want to run away loans and bought the land next door to the parking garage. But we saved it and they got restored. So instead of a dorm next down that street, 
that used to be that, and look at what it is now, because we put a hotel there, the right use, the right, the right organic use. And, that, and then, across the street, that's what it looked like that. I'm no kidding, on my main street, application looked like that, because a hotel at that time, and then next one, and it becomes a lively part of a town, all because the right use went. And then across the street, we have this square, it never had really become left. It was old, nagging square, they put a band shell on it in the floating square. It was just kind of scrubby. You had a surface park in that way, you see, and they had dumpsters. It just, you know, it's not, it was the opposite of elegant. So we had a great landscape architect, worked with the citizens, and said it could become a great urban square. And so, did that. And it is, it is gorgeous. And then the land values around it, that building was a federal building, $70 million hotel, right? You can't see that. There's a $110 million hotel. Beautiful. Just, just connects with the park. And then you run through these pictures with just the, the robustness of the fountains and the kids and the crafts and, and all the activity because citizens demanded that we transform that into a physical group. Okay, now, move to Charleston. So, so Charleston, the 18th and 19th century, Charleston, Lady Mother and the Fathers gave the water stage to the public. And so we had our chance to succeed or fail with this. The next picture you will see, and that was uh, on the water, obviously, and I had a big fire in the 50s. I remember I was a boy's got a camp, 20 miles away, you could see the smoke. And uh, so after the fire, it languished. No one would go to that part of town. We had the rotten pilings and all of that. So I got elected, and a wonderful couple from Philadelphia was willing to help us uh, if we would make it a park. And so we, I said, that's exactly what it ought to be. Another fellow came, kind of intervened and bought it. And uh, we didn't own it yet, and it's going to just vanish and stuff. You said, bunch of junk and all like that, and so on. So we threatened to condemn it, which the guy, we, we became a good friend, but he really didn't like the idea of us condemning his property, you know, but it's a part. Anyway, we, we worked out the deal on the land swap. So instead of that, we started on this vision of a great waterfront public park, something that would inspiring to our citizens to visit. So the first thing you do is you study what used to be there and study the grain of the city. And then we hired great landscape architects and we came up with that. And to achieve that, we built the park of Raja Shoot and then another one, uh, and, uh, another one to, so you didn't need the park taken on the street and then you saw what it looked like before we started. That's what it looked like the day we opened. And then uh, that's what it is now. And people adore it. It's their favorite place in the city. The water's edge, accessible to the public, the design and the detail, so fabulously beautiful. It's won plenty of awards. But the most important award is, is it, you see, a guy proposing marriage to the girl. <clears throat> those kind of, that's when you know the community loves it. And that's what it looked like when we opened it. It's just a, a fabulous, beautiful space. And then, uh, you know, all the beauty great. We got the fountain with the kids. And, you know, um, when we, um, and money's, money's always a problem. And we and I talked about this earlier today. <coughs> When you just keep trying to find how to get the money, because when we had a bid opening for this park, the contractor we got the little bid uh, came to me and said, Joe, it was all <coughs> over budget, of course. And he said, I know how to take the gold plate. I said, We're not taking any gold plate. Not that the gold plate was funny. Because the finery, you build something for citizens, you know, the great cities in the world, you go to the great city in the world, and they, you see nice stuff. 
in the public zone. And the reason they put nice stuff is because everybody owns it. You know, a person of modest means, they might not have a yard, and they sure don't have any granite, and they don't have a lot of stuff, but they can go to a public place, and they own just as much as anyone else. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> 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 the kids play in the fountain, and they have a great time. It's just fabulous. Now, I show you this because I'm in, in the design of a park, and, and when you're working and reimagining the city docks, and it's complicated. Better, is um, is figure out the purpose, and sometimes it might be purposes. But uh, when we figured out for this park, the purpose was simple. That a, this bustling city, this park, is different than any other park, needs a place for peace and repose. And so, in this park, which is different, we have no events. Uh, it's uh, no events. The National Trust has to have their annual dinner, then no. The Governor's Association came from around the no. No, it's, it's, it's one place where when you go, um, you own it. You know, no one's got a party rather than do a thing. So uh, and it's just a gorgeous park and the service is up. So then we started looking at the commitment to oh thank you taking a good carry. Uh, so looking at that by the way is the fourth of July and that was pretty soon there. So and uh, so anyway we started with this mystery's gap. So anyway we uh, looked at this ethic of public access on the water's edge. Yeah, because we get a lot of water's edge in Charleston, and so we started looking up, up river from the park, and um, and you see the, the gold, we said, trying to get the water's edge around it. So, so that's looking from the park north, and those piers and everything, and then you see the tall building. And we had plans to, to, to that part of town, and you'll see what we've done in a minute. And um, so, on that, uh, where that tall building is, if you can go back one, if I'm not making a dizzy, so the tall building, I needed to get in front of that new tall building. And uh, if the owners of the tall building didn't want that because they had no private situation, and I couldn't condemn it, but I needed, I didn't want you to be in one part of the corner. Or an edge, and then there's a gate, and you can't go through there. So, luckily, we were patient. And the bulkhead started failing. <laughs> so, the, the tall building people came to me and said, Mayor Ali, we, we know how to work this thing out. So, the city will acquire a bulkhead, fix it up several million dollars, um, then we can allow public access. So we did that, I and mean, it's very good to it close at 9.30 at night and all that. So now you can go to the next picture. So we see, we need to, how do we do this thing? And all these things are a piece at a time. So we needed to think a way to get around that and you can keep going. So now, these all things have happened over time, but there is water front connection all along that whole thing we see along there. Including, you see the tall building kind of right in the kind of middle, it's got the white roof. So, right in front of the tall building. And then I'm going to go all the way up to the end of this picture and show you a scruffy looking thing that I was right at the end of the street, Charlotte Street. And that's what it looked like. And I said, well, you've got to have something. Yeah. And so, we uh, worked to get the uh, get, uh, little. It's small, you know, people could criticize and spend a lot of money for a little piece on the water. But it's the last place you could go and you could put your dog and dogs. And uh, it's cost a lot of money. And then I got lucky because my good friends decided that we needed a, a, a monument to honor the Irish ancestry of Charleston. So politically, I was coming. Well, that was a fair. So anyway, we, got, we raised the money in the Irish water, and so instead of that scruffy looking thing on the water, show you this next one here, and then that pretty, and then we had the, uh, we had the 
T-shot from Ireland come and we uh, navigate the thing and everything. And we, so and then you go down to the water, instead of that jumpy looking stuff, you go keep it, you close you to the water, and then on the water, that's that's Ireland. Isn't that cool? Big granite and you know, the of Ireland and everything. So, so now that's the northern end of the, this area I was telling you about. So then right next to that, you see a little walkway. Uh, well, that's you see the water. Then the next one, you yeah, see a little walkway. It was nice looking. And then this weaves you around. So the next one, you're going to see the aquarium. One of the great aquariums in the park. Um, inspired by what we all did here years ago. And, and uh, it's fabulous. So the walkway comes along the aquarium, and then the next one you'll see you in front of that tall building there. You got that nice connection, and then you can see all that happens at the evening time, the parties, I mean, fireworks or whatever, and, and picnics and Fourth of July. I've been when really we got air show, and all of each piece the public has access. And then we got the maritime center, and then. If you work hard, you get lucky. So the most important work of all is building the International African American Museum, uh, which is 40 to 48 percent of all slave Africans who came to North America landed in Charleston. So I decided in the year 2000 we needed to build a museum to honor that for our country. It's not just Charleston. I mean, this is for our country, and so we. We're almost there, uh, $92 million it's going to, and we're almost there. So right next to that, and we got this that piece of land on the water I showed you, and then the next one, I think, yeah, that's the design for the International African American Museum. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, lift it up. It's lifted up because the land is sacred. It's where lots of enslaved Africans died there, and uh, it came in those circumstances. So it's lifted up to, to respect the honor of that. So we got a wonderful museum and all that in the connection, the water. And then on the other side of town, on the Ashley River, there was just a scruffy, no shoulder deal in the highway department. And we worked at it for a tough long time with a lot of money, but it had this little walk. And, uh, and sure, one more picture. And so when you did this, you know, I had a people stop and say, Joe, you know, I drive, I come through down the suburbs just to walk that. Well, I got, I got a, a friend who's now been in a big weight loss deal. He's my age and lost a lot of weight. And he walks that every day. A lot of people do too. So we had, you still go on the water and then you keep going up to a ballpark. And so we needed a, you know, my league ballpark. And uh, so we had this site for this old landfill. And, uh, and we built a ballpark. And when we were working in the ballpark, because it was very expensive, you know, on the water, and it was landfill, all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of my opponents, and one of my campaigns, real action campaign, said, Mayor Riley did not tell you, the citizens of Charleston, that he had to offer the free land out on the edge of town for the ballpark. And I said, No, I didn't tell you about that. Because, you know, free land is a cheap land. You build something for the public, you put on the best thing. Give the finest thing. So this is our ballpark, and this is the, the reason you do things like this, you see that that picture is, that, that description of that picture is, uh, is, which is hard to get sometimes, but <laughs> and, uh, the description of the picture is that, I would, I would cut that joy. You know, it's civic joy. I mean, the people are coming there so happy. And then, then in the next picture, you see what it looks like when you buy a hot dog and a cold beer or Coca Cola behind the first baseline. It's like an observation, observation deck on a national park on the water. The water belongs to everyone. Okay, so let's say that, uh, you know, we all kind of agree with this, but what about, what about? The mayor and others we had, what about the political support of this? I mean, it was a sad. You know, we had a democracy, not a dictatorship. You got it. So, um, so this is, this was Governor's liquor store. It's now moved across the street. We go back one and, uh, and Governor's liquor store 
and, and that's a place I go very infrequently. I promise that. But when I do need to buy a lift, I go there because I knew the guy was going out, and it's really kind of cool. And it used to be especially cool because they all wore pistols. Yeah. I mean, they got a permit from the state somehow. I mean, like in Charleston, it's hot, so there's no jacket. So they would be there with a the shirt and the pants and a holster and a pistol. You know, I mean, that's just what they had. So one day I was in there with my very modest purchase, and, uh, and these guys converged, you know, on that side of the counter like they were going to give me some information. Which, which can make you a little nervous if you were late, you know. And uh, so they converge, and uh, one of those guys won't talk to me about, but I'll show you this. We had this uh, intersection, go back one day, I mean, they, they very, we had this intersection, and uh, if we put the water line through there, a friend of mine said, you know, he said, Joe, why are you that up? Why don't you clip something? It was just asphalt. So I said that to uh, parks people, they came with that idea. So instead of that asphalt thing, uh, we got this next one, you see. Now rather than asphalt thing, you see what happened. And uh, so, so I'm at the lake store, one of the guys looked at me and said, man, you know what y'all did down there, Broad Brothers Avenue? I said, yeah. He said, that is the prettiest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> another guy, another guy kind of was, and you know, resting on his pistol, said, um, said, man, do you know where I live? Do you know where I live? And I said, sure, sure. I didn't know where he lived, but he had a pistol. <laughs> he said, I drive two miles out of the way going home every night just to ride by and look at that park. And another one said, that was a big tree y'all transplanted. And I said, we thought that would be nice. And then they wanted to get into flower bed, and then they wanted to get into architecture. These guys selling the liquor wanted to talk to me about what? Beauty. So the political supporters said, well, the political supporters said, what is the public policy imperative? Well, the public policy imperative is that's shown by this picture here, which is we are putting slate sidewalks in the city uh, where you used to have slate sidewalks in the 1800s when the city had the money, but then we got slate sidewalks by waterfront park, and they put the slate in, and um, and it just didn't look right. And it was because it looked like you just bought it from a big box. You know, the old slate sidewalks were worn and a little bit and everything, and then you put the new slates in, slate in, and it didn't work. So y'all got another slide very nice. So what we do is, on a slate sidewalk, you have the, uh, they came up, smart people came up with this idea, and we take a torch and go around the edge, and it rounds it. It doesn't just stop. But then it looks perfect. It's just right. Now I show you this, not that that's fascinating, but this is a city worker on his hands and knees attending to admittedly what is a pretty small detail in the city. But that is how we must feel about the city. That is a public policy imperative in the Athenian city of said we hold the city to trust to pass it to future generations rather than we can. So that's a public policy imperative. What is the moral imperative? What is why we have to get up in the morning and do this? And the moral imperative is shown by this uh, next slide, um, which is uh, the slogan for that is, that the city should be a place for every citizen's heart and sick. So when we built the waterfront park, we needed to build this. Go back one very nice. Oops, uh, go back, go forward. Now you're talking. So we are doing the first phase of waterfront park. You see, you look up the slide, and you got the surcharge, and that took a couple of years. So we needed to build this little pier. Was, the remnants had fallen in a long time ago. And we, found the big stones and the brilliant architects said, this is what we need to put. I thought we needed a rail around it. <coughs> you know, we had young kids, I worried about the children falling in the water in the harvest. They said, no, Joe, you don't need a rail around it. People not going to, say people might sit on the wooden benches, but they might sit on the granite and drape the legs over. Don't worry. I said, okay. So not long after this part of the park opened, I was jogging 
one morning at sunup, and I saw somebody doing exactly what they said, sitting there, legs draped over, drinking some coffee. And I knew him. I didn't disturb him. I kept jogging. But his name was Clarence Hopkins. He uh, suffered from epilepsy. He was very poor, rode a bicycle, lived with his mother, had part-time jobs, sweeping up in front of a gas station in China Shoes. I saw him a couple of weeks later, and I said, Clance, I saw you down at the park. And he said, yeah. I said, you go there often? He said, yeah, Joe, I go every morning. I said, why? He said, because it's so beautiful. And I love it when the sun's coming up, and then you see those big ships coming in. Um, you see, uh, for in the American city, uh, we have citizens uh, for whom that's all they've got. They've never been able to, Clarence Hopkins has never been to the Great Lakes or see the sunset in the Pacific or the Purple Mountain Majesties or Amber Waves. All he had was a city. Um, when we were opening the park, which was two years later when everything was done, I'd been looking for him because I wanted him to come to the opening. Because I wanted him to be there. Because he was, it was a couple of 13 years. It was a simple black doing this. And uh, now he had a stroke and um, lost his ability to speak and move and find a wheelchair. But I arranged my people, arranged the family, and we got him to go out to the Holy Ceremony of Walter Park. One of the most memorable nights for me. Yeah. Well, it was perfect. It was in May, sunset, symphony officer playing. Thousands of people there celebrating this new part. And we had front row seat plans. I didn't introduce him. And his family, why? Only why I went to all that time. But I wanted him there because I knew he would like it. But I wanted him there for me. My city county. And I said to that preservation organization. And all of those who engaged in that effort. I wanted him there for all of us to see and be mine. That if we work to build great cities of inspiration for the Clarence Hopkins and others, we will build great cities for everyone. Thank you very much.